G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. Welcome, everyone. Today, I'm interviewing Pete Kuziak from the Fun First Strategy based in Charlotte, United States of America. Thanks for your time today, Pete. Hey, yeah, no problem to have. Uh, glad to be here and glad to be part of the show. Let's start with how we know each other. Lindsay Dunn from Ballast Books, your publisher, put us in touch. Thought you'd be a great guest to have on. Yeah, absolutely. They've been really helping me promote my new book, doing a podcast tour. I was very happy to hear your name pop through. And in Australia, who doesn't want to be on a show in Australia? That's right. Best beaches in the world. Yeah. Well, maybe we talk a little bit about the book because that came out a couple of months ago in January. Tell yep. the audience a bit about your book, the title, obviously, and we'll link through it in the show notes. But, you know, what's in it for the audience of small business owners? Yeah, absolutely. It's called Drop the F-Bomb in Your Business with the Fun First Strategy. So kind of having some fun on some words there. It's a book that really hey fun as the core elements of building success and ultimately workplace happiness. How do we use that, whether customer service, the four walls, your people, everything and anything you can think. So really a total detonation of fun, Will. That's great. And it much needed. I think, especially in small business, high pressure owners get quite stressed and kind of forget to stop and celebrate. I certainly do. I'm shit house at it. I've actually got to put things in place to remind me to celebrate things, milestones with the team, etc. I think it's a great topic. Yeah, thanks. It's uh, definitely well needed. You know, I think just from a play culture, right? You can I call it play. Prioritize laughter and youth. It's it you really move away from that grind culture, right? The burnout, high stress, problem sleeping, all all the all the things that come along with that high grind mentality. This is a little bit more about like why can't we just enjoy what we do? Really, truth truthfully love it and you're going to be better at problem solving creative thinking all sorts of good things happen when you kind of let your guard down have a little fun play as you work yeah absolutely tell the audience a bit about your business we'll focus on the on your current coaching business now and then we'll the next question will take us right back to the start tell us about the coaching business what it does and how it makes yeah, it yeah it's called the fun first strategy and it really is a consultancy coaching business where we're teaching companies really how to bring play and fun into the environment to, to build irresistible culture one of the first things we talk about and coach on is who's the champion of fun once you've bought into the concept once you understand that this is hey my mindset is the fact that i, I do need this it's something that's going to elevate my culture my people my performance everything who's going to champion we talk about that we have a force to become a champion of fun and then we have a class where we actually certify businesses as fun first businesses they get all the bragging rights with that but I, I find that the companies that do decide to do that really take pride because when you go to recruit or when you're talking with customers they see that trophy we actually give a trophy for a certified fun first business and it's not just a talking point but it's proof that you're dedicated to a different type of doing different way of doing business that you're prioritizing healthy environment and prioritizing mental health awareness which is so huge right? and especially with younger generations wanting to come in and, and especially after the shake-up of COVID as well a lot of people reflected on their health not just physical health but mental health as well and not wanting to work for shitty bosses anymore or b- bad toxic cultures that's the thing I mean the new work like I was saying the new workforce is demanding this really shows proof that like hey we're committed to it we've done the studies we've done the commitment to learning the processes to make this a better work environment I love it I'm a systems and that's, more about, that's the consultancy that's kind of what we aim to do is really build help people build irresistible cultures of fun yeah Yep, love it. And how did you start out? Really, it was just a passion project. Having consulted and worked with different brands and different companies over the years, I just started seeing a theme. The companies that were having the most fun, the ones that were really prioritizing their employees' healthiness and laughter, those are the ones that were most successful. So if we can, can put this into a strategy, if we can make this into a tangible thing, I knew we could create better opportunities for businesses. So that's really kind of how it came about. And then obviously putting those concepts into a book so that I could really show that this is a tangible thing because you know fun and work sometimes like polar opposites when it comes time for talking to executives and stuff they're really not a lot of buy-in at first but i think we're just starting to gain momentum on what that possibility could be yeah and maybe go back your business journey right back to the start college or university if you went any corporate jobs and then any businesses in between there and, and the coaching business now yeah so this is a great story i hope we will enjoy it but i went to school originally i was going to be a phys ed teacher i earned a degree in exercise science concentration in coaching kinesiology and and once I graduated, I found out pretty quickly that teaching at the higher level like, wasn't really for me. I actually answered an ad in a newspaper, go figure. And it said, do you, aging, do you enjoy working with kids? Do you have a background in sport? Friday, if so, call this number. And it happened to be a little gym, which is a children's fitness franchise, gymnastics and, and motor skill development as a way to grow confident. Linked up with them and the rest was history. I, I was working at the local level for a wonderful franchisees and quickly made a name of myself. I I was going to work at their corporate headquarters over that entire franchise world franchise. Moved out to Phoenix. 
Phoenix, Arizona, and was a corporate trainer where I got to teach and train the little gym and be part of that process with new and existing franchisees. And then eventually slid into their operations consulting or franchise business coaching department where I got to learn more about the business side. And you know, the thing about coaching and training entrepreneurs is you get the itch to do it yourself. Surrounded by all the you know, people doing wonderful things, you kind of get the urge to go do it. So we did. My wife and I moved back here to North Carolina and we opened our first little gym franchise in 2009 and then two more within a five-year time span. So we had three and five years. Ultimately built up a, a nice organization where we could step back and put leaders in place and kind of live the dream, as they say, become semi-absentee, absentee owners and created the opportunity for me to go dabble in other businesses and bring my coaching and bring some of my passion for business back to some brands in that franchising realm. So I've worked with several different brands across different services, Yeah, which led me to kind of compile all these ideas and tricks of the trade, so to speak, into a terrific book and, and consulting concept that is really starting to take off. And do you still own the three little gyms or you sold the franchises? We sold one in 2017. It was a great moment for us as we had sold it to actually one of our managers. We're really proud of that. The fact our legacy continues with somebody that we really believed in. Fortunately, we did close one strategically during COVID. In North Carolina, we had very hard shutdowns, especially in the fitness sector. So we decided to kind of put some of those resources into the one that's still open now. And it's doing fantastic. Hated that we had to, to close that one down, but ultimately using those resources to keep people employed and build longevity has, has really paid off so yeah great and how old were you in 2009 when you decided to become a business owner 15 years Ooh, ago i was 30 30 great yeah almost 30 and do you have any key numbers you can share to illustrate the growth of that business over the last 15 years yeah, so it's been pretty astronomical, to be honest with you. That coming from in the U.S., you know, having our recession and opening a business in 2008, 2009, 2010, it's like a lot of businesses were closing. We were just starting. From that point till now, it is, it's unreal. I mean, 100% of, of growth for me, not just from a revenue perspective, going from like 300,000, 3 to 400,000 yearly revenue to 8, 9 million in gross revenues. But I think the thing to me that is that we're most proud of is that our employee retention is high. We have had team members with us for 10 plus years. Wow. Wow, that's great. We're super proud of that, that people have committed to us and we've committed to them and built a relationship on fun and trust, really keeping the spirit of why we opened these to begin with was to create opportunities for kids to grow. So everybody kind of aligned in that, that that vision of why with some fun is really a big difference. That's so, great. How many full-time equivalent team members did you start with the first franchise? And The first one, my wife and I were pretty busy in that one when we first got started. We still maybe had six to eight employees beside us as we opened up a second location. We had to pull back from day-to-day -day operations. So then we had like 20 employees. When we had, by the time we had our third location, we had 30 to 35 employees. Yeah. With full-time? That was a mix. I'd say full to usually you have three to four full timers, maybe six to seven FTE per location, just depending on the yeah. size of kids coming and members and stuff that come in. Yeah. When was the moment you felt like you had succeeded? I'm still waiting for that moment. <laughs> Gonna change this bloody yeah. question. Everyone answers yeah. the same way. Everyone answers the same way. Humility is one of the things on my list of core values. When we first got out of debt, was a big indicator to us. This was going to make something for us. This was really going to be an opportunity to open up our financial goals, getting out of debt, which you can imagine in five years, opening three locations was stacking debt upon each other. It was 2014. We got out of debt. We celebrated. We actually went to Hawaii. I ran my first marathon. <laughs> Wow. Celebrated by running. But that's when I felt not only success physically as a person, right? Being able to accomplish something like that, but to have that debt, to take a vacation with the family was incredible. It's kind of my first glimpse, if you will. And what does success look like to you? Success to me is financial freedom. I think as an entrepreneur, you always want to have financial freedom to make decisions, whether it's to invest in, in more business, invest in your people that work for you, invest in your family, your family's future, homes, whatever that is, whatever your mind can come up with, whatever creatively you can say, I want that. I think that would be something neat and having the financial freedom to do that. That's success to me. But honestly, the ability to leave a legacy for my kids and knowing that they have the abilities to do the things that they want to do and maybe not grind as hard as I had to. It's a stuff really, I think, to me would be the ultimate legacy, the ultimate goal. Number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast growing business? Honestly, I'm the proponent of fun. I believe that wholeheartedly is that if you want to have success at all, play your way to success. Prioritize laughter and you. If customers want to have fun with you. They want to laugh with you. They want to remember what it was like to be youthful and experience neat things. Break those moments with your team. Break those moments with your customers. Yep. And you use Net Promoter Score. Do you know what your number is or was? Yeah, so we do use a Net Promoter Score at our little gym, Charlotte. Yep. Um, we're about an 86% right now. So we do phenomenal. As a matter yep. of fact, little gyms as a whole around the world, very high in 
Yeah, that's great. Net promoter score, though, is a positive or a negative score, not a percentage. But if, if it's 86 positive, that is a phenomenal result. Well done. Yeah, thank you. And how did you fund the business? In 2008, I mean, we opened in 2009. In 2008, there wasn't a lot of loan going around. So we actually had to ask family to help us fund, which is always interesting. Yes. Were they loans or they came in as investors? They came in as investors and with loans. Eventually, the loans were paid off and we were able to negotiate uh, the ability for them to step away, which was another indicator of success as well. That's great. So you bought them out eventually. Yeah, I'd say they kind of pulled themselves out. If you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go in, into your industry? I guess we're talking about the coaching right now. Without having the skill sets that I've acquired, probably not. If I had unlimited resources or had funding available, I really do love the franchise model. If you can find a franchise that aligns with you, personal beliefs, a product that you love, that you think is going to be a hit in your market, go for it. The copy-paste model, it takes a lot of the risk away. Going into the coaching and consulting world, I think you got to have some substance and have lived it, breathed it, so that you can build credibility and trust. All the money in the world isn't going to buy you that. Yep. Can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so our audience can learn from it? Cash flow is always, as a business owner, is always something that can be tricky, right? So I can remember times where you're paying, I was paying everybody else but ourselves and making sure payroll, everybody was taken care of and it was getting tight and we had to make a decision. Are we going to have to go get more capital or can we sweat it out just a little bit longer and move some monies around? Look at the expenses. Is there any way to move monies around so that we can continue to go down the path? Our own? Luckily, we were able to get creative and adjust funds. And I think one of the things I learned early on coaching um, small business owners, especially in the recessions, you have to be pliable. You have to be pliable with your expenses. If you're married to the fact that you have to make a certain amount as the business owner and you're putting the stress of taking a payroll while you're operating, it's good and it's not good. Good because if you have the ability to do that, but it's not because it's really you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. You have to really be pliable enough to, to adjust. And a lot of people, well, we have make cuts, so I'll cut staff or I'll cut marketing. No, you can't. You can't cut staff. You can't cut marketing. So people still need to do business. You need to look at some other things that you can do. Talk to your landlord if you have a brick and mortar. See if you can do a rent abatement for a few months or move those dollars to the end of the lease or renegotiate leases and try to save some money. Try to negotiate and revisit your insurance. Every Every year, go and ask if there's any savings you can get in your insurance. You might find some extra dollars there. There's always things you can do if you're looking at expenses and pliable maneuver, right? As opposed to the stresses of, I have to pay these things. I have to pay myself. It's always this dollar amount. Now you got to go in and adjust frequently. Yeah. What area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? Obviously, for me, it was learning financials, accounting, things like that. I had come from the life of the little gym. Right. I had worked at the corporate office before. And so operationally, I knew what to do. There's a lot of lessons learned there too about empowering your people. And it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay when your team isn't as good as you, right? We learned those lessons along the way too. But for me, it was really a lot about how to really run a business by the financials. I had to ask for help, hire accountants. I had to hire bookkeepers. I had to ask questions to make sure that I had to settle up at the end of the day. <laughs> All those things that I thought I knew, but I really didn't. What have you enjoyed the least about managing fast growth? The thing that sticks out is you lose a little bit of the connectivity with your customer audience as an owner operator. Like you're in there, you're operating, you get to see everybody, but fast growth enables you to put people into play, power your team to that. So you're not necessarily on the front line working with your customers. So the smiles in our business are smiles, high fives, hugs from the students. You don't get to experience that much. Your team does, but you don't when you're working on your business instead of in your business. For me, that was kind of just have to accept they're there if you want to go back in, but ultimately you're, you're stepping away from that environment you're looking for growth, you're looking for opportunities to expand, you're not in those operations. If you're cooking burgers or something like that, not that big of a service space, high emotional environment, it was neat to be part of that. Are you a small business owner who is ready to take your professional growth to the next level? Sign up to the Grow Small Business Weekly Newsletter. This is your go-to email every Friday and will take about two minutes to read. Join the Grow a Small Business community who, like you, are investing in their professional development. Each week, we curate valuable resources, whether it's expert advice, books, podcasts, industry insights, or actionable strategies. We've got you covered. Leave your email at growsmallbusiness.com slash weekly. What do you love most about growing a small business? The impact it has on 
the people you employ. The more successful you are, the more opportunities you create for people. There's a lot of charm in small business, a lot of charm. There's a lot of opportunities to create, to create amazing, like I say, irresistible cultures that you just don't in corporate, large corporate, small business. It's intimate. It's the way you want it to be. And it's an exciting time. It really is. What has been the biggest mindset shift for you in your small business growth journey? That I am not the only one that can do things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I hinted at that before. It's really important you empower your people. It's really important that you create a winning culture. And that even if you have the answer, you make sure they, that the person that's empowered to give the answer gives the answer. Saying something like, hey, why don't you go see? They'll be happy to help you. And understanding when to hit that pause button, so to speak. Because you don't want to step over anybody. and You want to empower the people that work. So I had to learn that. Like a lot of people, they want the quick answer. Now you could give them the quick answer as a business owner. If I was a for them make sure that they talk to the person that was really there to help them grow the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain be the keeper of your company culture be aware of subcultures as they exist but be the keeper of the culture you want that means a habit of checking in celebrating victories weekly creating a schedule whatever that is honestly in, in the book I, there's a lot of things you can do to implement for a fun culture but if your culture stamp whatever that stamp is that you say this is what we want you're the keeper of that you need to cr create a habit of making sure that that is always present. Now, over 15 years with uh, three sites in the franchise business in particular, you would have hired, had to let a lot of people go, you know, peaking around 35 people on the team. Can you talk to how you've added people to the team, some wins, mistakes, and advice for those listening? Yeah, adding people to the team is always, for us, was we always wanted to make it fun, right? Our product was fun. Our environment was fun and inviting. If you couldn't adapt to that or if you weren't aligned with that, we couldn't stay together, right? When we would hire people, our job ads were electric. We talked about the culture. They talked about what we did. They talked about being a fun work environment where you get to come in and teach and be barefooted no ties and things like that we celebrate what made us that that charm we celebrate what made us different our interview process completely different i learned that when you are hiring people these folks are interviewing at all sorts of companies anybody that will invite them in that may be a corporate environment and if you are a small business owner interviewing like a corporate you know, a gargantuan or any corporate because that's the background you come from you're going to lose they're going to walk in your space and see that it's different automatically so we had to stop trying to interview that way and embrace what made us different. What made us different was our environment, our exposure things. We would introduce people to the environment right away. And then our question process was quite unique too. In that brand, there's a lot of singing. We would actually ask them when they interview, hey, will you sing? Sing a song with me? <laughs> to, ask them to sing for me. That's like, kind of weird. Sing with me. So we're singing a song together. And, and you know, it's a mixed reaction to that. But honestly, that is the type of personality we're looking for. Did you actually right. go on to sing a song with them? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, that's well, like, I'm a little teapot. Mary had a little lamb. You pick it. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm a terrible uh, singer. I used to have to do backup vocals in the band back when I had hair 30 years ago, and I hated it because I can't do two things at once, play guitar and sing, let alone have an actual good voice to sing. Unlike my daughter, she's brilliant. You know, there's there's diverse perspectives of fun. That's what it comes down to. But what we found was the worse you sang, the funnier it was to a kid. Yeah, that's good. That's kind of summing up like the, the high music. We really needed to make sure that there were people that could embrace our unique quirky charm as a small business. And we pushed that out. That's who we were and we didn't hide behind it. Yeah. And what about any mistakes or they were quite minimal? I'm guessing a lot of your HR, your, sorry, your recruitment procedure came from the franchise or, or standalone. You guys could tailor it however you want. Yeah. To. You know, honestly, franchise in the U.S., franchising is tricky because it can interfere with who's truthfully the hiring person and who's not. As a franchisee, you're pretty much on your own. Now, they may give you samples of job ads and different things or yeah. you could share with other franchisees but ultimately because of the way the laws work you have to it's on your own and any mistakes you made during recruiting or you nailed it from day one Absolutely. Like I shared, doing traditional, formal job ads, interviews, sit down for just didn't work. You could see it all written yep. over his face. If they, they were a great candidate and they interviewed really well, when it was time to come to show up to work, maybe they didn't show up or, or they worked for a week or two and didn't stay because we just weren't culturally aligned. Just I didn't paint a picture of what this environment was truthfully like. You can see it when you walk in and have perception, perceived notions of the, what it might look like. But if I never told you you were going to sing with a child and you're coming in for day one, 
moment of training and you're singing and you're not comfortable singing, you're leaving. You're not coming up showing to the second day. So we learned that. That, I mean, was happening to us, right? We were, People wouldn't show up or they would quit after a few days. And we just need to make sure everybody knows what this unique, quirky environment really is. And, and people will come in and say, yep, this really isn't what I thought it would be. And that's fine. No, you can't take that personally. If somebody, first of all, shows up to an interview, good for you. <laughs> in the environment we're in ghosting is crazy so if they're showing up for an interview who knows how long that drive for them we don't know those things they're determining factors that they're going through their head to decide to work for you or not but we needed to figure out the best way to put ourselves out there we learned from just kind of a little trial and error but took our hits to the chin on mistakes because we just i don't think we were being transparent enough about what it was really going to take a lot of companies experience that yeah, I agree. What are some of the things you recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? Fun. Anytime you can infuse fun, do it. Kind of pivoting away from my experiences at Little Gym, I'm working and chatting with clients now about how to really elevate that interview process and have fun with it. Interviewing seems to be a hot topic right now, but I recommend you go to the local indoor amusement park and go-karting, miniature golfing or go-karting for your interview. One, you're setting a tone that you're completely different than everybody else. You value fun, but think about what happens when you play those games. Games. You're seeing how people problem solve, how they negotiate, how they risk take, how they creatively think, how competitive they are. These are all sets that they're going to use the job. And if they're a, a total miss, well, you still have fun as the interviewee, the hiring manager, as a business owner. And you had an amazing time. You made your day a little bit easier. I think that that, to me, is the key to success is figure out what, first of all, what you think is fun. Own your brand. Make sure it's PC. I follow the rule of grandma. If you wouldn't do it in front of grandma, don't do it in front yeah. of anybody. We don't want to our nightmares here. Figure out what that commonality is. Find your brain. Is there any commonalities that you have with your team, general population, whatever? Like, oh, I like music. Let's infuse music into interviewing. Let's infuse music into our work day. Let's in whatever the case might be. And I think that adding those unique little pieces goes so far. Tell our audience how you've handled balance. Work-life balance is that's where the workplace happiness piece comes in. And I, when you create moments of joy through fun and play, especially as you're able to work, you have to think about the amount of hours we put in that work. If you're in that grind mentality, you know it's it's a tough, it's tough to dig out of too. And your healthiness starts to slide. But if you can infuse, like, what do you like to do at home? This is why, although COVID was awful, it talks a lot about the things we value and the things that are really important to us, like going for a walk. We used to have family walk night. Every night we'd go for a walk, but we would never have prioritized that other one. Now it's like, how can we build that into our normal daily routines? So you're finding the things that you know already bring you healthiness because we've had to experience that. How do you infuse that now into your work day? You've got to find that balance. I actually call them mandatory fun breaks. In the book, I write about mandatory fun breaks. If you read the book, it's actually kind of neat because I built these little games and activities into the book, just like you did as a kid, word searches and things like that. Like, no, before you read this next chapter, you're taking a mandatory fun break. Release your mind for a minute or two, right? You're absorbing a lot. Give yourself permission to step away. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever you need. You know what you need. It's a dose of fun. That's really what will help you stay healthy, but you ultimately know what you need. And how much professional development have you invested in yourself? I've been pretty lucky to work with amazing brands that have invested in me to get skills in different areas. Personally, I've invested, obviously, I'm a certified happiness coach. I'm a certified human resources consultant. So I've invested in the education to, to do those particular things and then to marry those two together. And what I'm doing now is, is a perfect blend. And you had mentors or coaches along the way? Always. A good, successful person is always <laughs> going to pass that along the credit to somebody else. I've had amazing mentors over the years from executives that prioritize the healthiness of their workers, whether it's delivering Starbucks to the office every day, no matter what, or celebrating victories, taking amazing trips, had mentors in business, family to teach me how to be tough when I needed to be tough. As you can imagine, the guy that pushes fun, sometimes having to be tough and saying no can be an issue, but it can be important when, when you're dealing with business, but also how to prioritize and make sure that you're still hitting your business numbers. To really have to measure the healthiness from a KPI standpoint. I've had mentors show me that. So I've been really blessed in life to have mentors through each journey. There's somebody always shows up. It's been amazing. There's always somebody that's teaching me something. So I'm grateful for those opportunities. Do you have or did you have a board of advisors or directors? Never went down that route. Never had a board of advisors or directors. I have been on boards before. I was actually on a, a board for our local preschool here. Enjoyed that very much. We got to collaborate and stuff, but I personally never have had the opportunity to experience. 
Now, Pete, you're one of the few we've had on that has exited a business. We exited two. You sold one of the franchise locations and you had to shut the other one down. Any advice for the audience thinking about exiting one day? You should always be thinking about your exit plan. One of the false ideas is that you're going to go into business and do it for the rest of your life. Or in some of the brands I've been with, it's almost felt taboo to talk about when am I going to leave, right? Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you have an idea of when you want to retire or when you want to pass it to a child or sell and move forward? Selling typically, in my experience, comes when there's things wrong. Maybe you're not hitting the success metrics you put in front of yourself. It's like, I guess I'm going to sell. That's okay to be in that place. And it's okay to think about what's worth it to me selling my business, a discounted rate or a fire sale so that I can save my mental health and my maybe pursue other interests, things like that. That's okay. It's all right to have that realization with yourself that maybe this just wasn't the, the thing. But I also think that you should be looking at this by 10 years. The older you get, like, how long do you want to put in? How much capital do you want to put in? What equity goals do you have for your Yourself, what wealth goals do you have for yourself? And when you hit those, what's next? A good exit strategy is important. Think about that. I, I would encourage the listeners, think about, am I going to sell so I can retire and have a dream retirement? Am I going to sell because I'm going to prioritize my mental health and my health because maybe I'm not hitting the goals I want to? Or am I going to continue to grow and expand so that I can leave a legacy for my children right. or for a loved one? So those are really your three options, but have a plan in place. Yeah, it's great exit advice, Pete. Okay, Pete, we're on our final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? The hardest thing is making sure you're not undercapitalized. Make sure you have the financial resources to build the proper business that you've set for. I've seen a lot and coached a lot of folks over the years that they're undercapitalized, trying to stretch, trying to get, I call it too cute <laughs> with job offers or marketing. You get what you pay for, plan proper funds so that you can hit the goals that you want. Because if once it starts sliding and you try to shift those around, your quality will slide as well. Yeah. Favorite business book, which has helped you the most? Profit First was a great book that I read a long time ago. I think going businesses through with the recession, through the pandemic, the pliability I talked about and trying making sure that you're running a business with profitability in mind was very beneficial to me, especially for somebody that didn't really wasn't a student of numbers and understanding how that all worked out. I, I gained quite a bit. From yeah, it's a great book. Any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? I wish there were more. For me, I'm a man of faith. I'm always going to devotions, looking at ways to inspire myself through the word and try to remember why I do what I do every day. One tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? I would say a good business plan. <laughs> yep. Whether you go and get one, whether you have been given one. What I mean by a business plan is I don't mean the textbook, I wrote a business plan so I can get an SBA loan or whatever it is. I'm not like an actual business plan pro forma. One that you put a business number, a revenue goal, and it's going to break down every step you need from a KPI perspective to achieve that goal. You need that in and then you influence that with your culture, your personality, your people, your experiences, your customer interactions. You have to have that plan in place. I'm a real believer of, even though I teach a lot about fun and culture, I'm a real big proponent of watch your numbers. Yeah. Throw your business by your numbers mm. because you can influence all those numbers at any time. Finally, my favorite question, what would you tell yourself on day one of starting out 15 years ago? I would say have more fun. <laughs> have more fun. It's going to be okay. I earned these gray hairs by thinking that I could do it all. Having kids along the way, all the stuff as a young entrepreneur. But if you prioritize fun, people are going to come and go. Businesses flows ups and downs. But when you prioritize the right things, have laughter in your life. Remember why you became a business owner, because you have goals in place for wealth and equity and all the good things that you want they'll come but it's some things are just not worth stressing over that's right great advice thanks so much for your time today pete really enjoyed our chat congratulations to you your wife and the wider team on the success and growth with the little gyms and also great work you're doing at the moment coaching and helping other businesses and business owners and teams inject a lot more fun so thank you thanks Rick. glad you had me on the show that's it. Thanks for listening. Please leave a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. It means more small business owners will find our cast and help people with their business growth journey.